to the final year students, block three. This is Dr. Maheshwar Naidu. Um, this is the fourth lecture out of five. Our topic today is peptic ulcer disease. Just to recap, we have had a lecture on acute abdomen, a practical approach to the acute abdomen. We've also looked at uh, bowel obstruction. And then we've had a lecture, I think it was last week, on the acute management of severe burns. Today, we're going to look at peptic ulcer disease in a fair amount of detail. And tomorrow uh, afternoon is actually the final lecture because you have to change over to your orthopedic block on Wednesday. So tomorrow's lecture is on the approach to uh, abdominal trauma. So tomorrow, 2.30 will be the final lecture from me. Okay, so um, to get going with this lecture, we've got a summary of what we're going to be looking at today. And we will start by looking at the epidemiology and pathophysiology of peptic ulcers. And we will focus on Helicobacter pylori in particular and non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatories. And then we're really going to focus a lot on the management, the acute management, medical management, um, the surgical management. Surgical management is really only reserved for cases of complications of uh, peptic ulcer disease. So I'm just trying to see what's happened to my video. So I just want to run through a few definitions. And uh, the first definition we're going to be looking at is the actual definition of peptic ulcer disease. I'm just going to, as usual, request people in the audience to um, unmute their mics. Let's start with Msiziwake Zakuza. Msiziwake. Nothing happening. Okay, let's choose someone else. Ndile Tini. So the question is on definitions. Um, and what we are looking for is the definition of peptic ulceration. Um, if I can just have someone. Uh, Pumzila Shabango. Pumzila, are you with us? Are you able to unmute your mic? Oh, yes, I am, Doctor. Uh, Pumzila? Uh, so, uh, in terms of, I don't have an extensive definition. I just know that it's an answer that occurs in the lining, it can be, it can involve the, the stomach or the duodenum. Okay, and what, what is it in, what is it in fact? It can, I agree with you, it can involve the stomach and duodenum, but what's actually the problem? What is the pathology, let's say? So you have, in terms of the pathology, you have disruption in the, in the mucosa, it may be, may be due to increased um, hydrochloric acid secretion. Yeah, so you basically have a break in the mucosa, that's correct. Right? So you have an opening or a break in the mucosa, and that um, results in um, pain, it can result in a whole lot of complications, right? And just to bear in mind that you can also get peptic ulceration outside of the stomach and duodenum. And one example of that is in the Meckel's diverticulum, uh, where you have a peptic mucosa occurring, uh, ectopic peptic mucosa. Okay, good. Then our next uh, definition um, is related to uh, gastritis and duodenitis, right? And I think I'm just gonna run through these quickly. Um, it's characterized by infl inflammatory changes of the gastric or duodenal mucosa secondary to infectious or irritant agents. And what we uh, need to understand here is that um, the pain can be very similar 
to pectic ulceration. It's not possible to clinically differentiate the pain. And uh, you need to be aware that patients uh, may have gastritis, judonitis, or they may in fact have peptic ulcer disease. Uh, see, someone has a hand up. Uh, Siobhan Singh, you have got a hand up. Hi, Doc. Sorry to disturb you. Uh, we're not able to see your slides. Oh, dear. Uh, let me just share my screen again. Just, are you able to see now? Yes, it's on now. Thank oh, you. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Okay, so um, the definition of gastritis and judonitis is listed. We're then going to move on to erosions. Now, it's important to appreciate that erosions are very similar to peptic ulcers, except that there is a size difference. So erosions are also a break in the mucosal lining, uh, but they tend to be less than five millimeters. So if you see on endoscopy, for example, a break in the uh, mucosal lining, but uh, it's less than five millimeters, that would be an erosion. However, once it progresses beyond five millimeters, then that becomes a peptic ulcer. And lastly, we will be looking at this in more detail. Uh, giant ulcers um, more, are more than three centimeters in diameter in the stomach. And in the duodenum, if it's more than two centimeters, it's considered a giant ulcer. Okay, moving on to the epidemiology. Now, there are only two main contributory factors. Uh, let's see if we can get some people to answer that. Um, Simpiwe Mtambo, are you with us? Um, hello, Doc. Hi, Simpiwe. So what are the two main contributory factors in peptic ulcers? Um, so I know that uh, um, usage of NSAIDs can contribute. Yes, correct. That's one of the main contributors. And the second one? Um, the second one, uh, I'm not sure, but it has something to do with H. pylori. Yes. I'm quite sure. Yes, you're correct on both counts, right? Good, well done. So Helicobacter pylori is basically a bacterium uh, which was discovered to be associated with the um, pathogenesis of peptic ulcer disease. Right? There's quite a lot of information on this in this year's seminar. The seminar on peptic ulcer disease was repeated this year in 2020. I have uploaded that text to uh, Moodle. So I hope you guys had an opportunity to download and read it. Or perhaps you all had actually attended the seminar. Right? But there's quite a lot of information on Helicobacter pylori in that seminar. And uh, it's important that you have a good understanding of that. I'm, I don't have time today to go into too much detail on Helicobacter pylori, um, helicobacter pylori, but we will touch on that. And then the second uh, contributory factor uh, that Simpiwe mentioned was non steroidal anti-inflammatory um, drugs, right? So what about things like spicy food? Right, this is something that uh, people very frequently say, they'll come into SOPD or come to see you uh, as a GP and say, oh, you know, I've been eating some spicy food and I'm sure I've got peptic ulcers because they point to the epigastrium and they complain that it's burning and painful, etc. But uh, the fact of the matter is that spicy food does not cause peptic ulcers, right? It can definitely contribute to gastritis and reflux disease. I'm sure all of you have had uh, uh, the experience after having eaten something spicy a couple of hours later, or if you're trying to lie down that same evening trying to fall asleep, this burning sensation in the epigastrium troubles you. Right, so they are associated with gastritis and reflux disease, as reflux esophagitis, but not um, etiological factors related to peptic ulceration. Right, a little bit more detail on Helicobacter pylori. Uh, it may progress to contribute to gastritis. It can progress to pro peptic ulcer disease. It, has even been shown to have um, pathogenesis in gastric adenocarcinoma, as well as malt tumors, which are called, uh, which stands for mucosa-associated lymphoidal tissue, right? 
Um, now, it's important to bear in mind that Helicobacter pylori is very common. If you were to screen the population, for example, and to test them for Helicobacter pylori, as much as 10% of the population have Helicobacter pylori, but this doesn't mean that those 10% of people have symptoms. Right? So there's a lot of patients who are Helicobacter pylori positive, but are asymptomatic. Okay. So it's important to appreciate that every patient that has Helicobacter pylori, if you send the patient for a scope or you perform an upper GI endoscopy yourself, uh, you, there's certain tests that you can do for Helicobacter pylori. And if it comes back positive, but there are no uh, features of gastritis or peptic ulcer disease, it's not always necessary to treat those patients. Okay. Certainly if they have symptoms and they are not um, settling or they have epigastric symptoms, even though you don't find any evidence of gastritis and or peptic ulcers, you may treat that helicobacter pylori, but you don't want to treat every single patient that has helicobacter pylori because some of them are uh, just asymptomatic carriers. Okay, so it's important to understand that fact. Any questions, guys, please put up your hand. Right, then non steroidals are the commonest cause of mucosal injury in Western populations. It causes impairment of mucosal defense, and this is related to the COX-1 um, inhibition. Right, and it also is associated with decreased um, mucus, gastric mucus production, and decreased gastric blood flow. Right, and this uh, reduces the ability of the gastric mucosa to actually protect itself. Okay, so that's all I'm really going to be touching on with regard to epidemiology. We're now going to move across to clinical features. And uh, um, symptoms for me. Can we ask non sicilello zikali? Good morning, Doc. Hi, Nancy Galele. Yes, how are you? Well, are you? I'm good. So we're just looking for... So one of the clinical features can be um, a burning, a burning intim intermittent gastric pain. Yes. Yes, so if it's duodenal, it's going to be relieved by food and ingestion. Good. And if it's gastric, it's going to be exacerbated by food intake. Good, correct. Right. Yes. Anything else then, associated besides the Okay, pain? They, can, they can also be a uh, dysmotility. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and then they can that? be vomiting. Yes. Yeah, they can be vomiting. Okay. So it's like, Good. it's like, um, it will present with a non-painful non discomfort in the upper abdomen yes. or fullness. Yes. Okay, good. Now, I think you've covered that pretty well. Thank you very much. So uh, upper abdominal pain, you even went into detail about what relieves and what exacerbates uh, in the different types of conditions. Uh, patients can also have weight loss. They also very frequently are asymptomatic, right? So that's important to appreciate. Uh, this non has touched on the classic pain, duodenal ulcer pain, is felt as a gnawing or burning sensation and is related to meals. It typically occurs after the meals or at night, and it is in fact relieved by food. Gastric ulcers, on the other hand, tend to be exacerbated uh, or precipitated by food. Okay, good. Now, what is the best way to assess the stomach, esophagus, and duodenum? Let me ask Sianda Shezi. Sienna, you with us? Sienna shares you with us? Nope. Mm, Shira Sudi? Is it by doing an endoscopy? Yes. Um, so specifically, endoscopy is a very general word. Uh, what is the what is the correct or full name for this procedure? Upper endoscopy. 
yeah, upper GI endoscopy, or you can call it an esophageal gastro right? Or uh, duodoscopy, where we're actually looking into those areas, right? Good. And I've got a little video clip to show you what this is about. I think an endoscopy you is know. a procedure used to visually examine your upper digestive system. During an endoscopy, your doctor gently inserts a long, flexible tube or endoscope into your mouth, down your throat, and into your esophagus. A fiber optic endoscope has a light and tiny camera at the end. Your doctor can use this device to view your esophagus, stomach, and the beginning of your small intestine. The images are viewed on a video monitor in the exam room. If your doctor sees anything unusual, such as polyps or cancer, he or she passes special surgical tools through the endoscope to remove tissue or collect a sample to examine it more closely. That's a very simple uh, explanation of what an upper GI endoscopy is all about. And it is, in fact, the gold standard for diagnosing peptic ulcer disease. In the past, before the advent of this type of technology, we were uh, reliant on um, imaging investigations, x-ray investigations. That's where barium meal and um, uh, swallow, I've discussed this with you previously, all those different types of modalities were used. But they were very indirect, and it was very easy to miss um, this pathology. Now, with the high-definition endoscopy available, um, it's possible to diagnose these very quickly and at relatively low risk to the patient. Okay, this procedure can be done under sedation or even just um, local anesthetic spray without the need for theater or um, admission, etc. Okay, any questions? Please put up your hands. Now, I'd uh, like to just um, emphasize with upper abdominal pain, right? A lot of patients will automatically uh, believe this is due to ulcers, just like, um, you know, patients with perianal complaints say they all have piles, right? But it's important for us as clinicians to actually uh, identify what is true ulcer pain and to exclude other possible causes, right? And this requires that an abdominal ultrasound should always be done. Right, in any patient that has upper abdominal pain or epigastric pain. Can anyone tell me why this might be? Mm. Tobile Tela. So the question, Tobile, is why uh, should we be doing abdominal ultrasound in all patients that have epigastric pain? Um, the only thing I can think of is maybe you're trying to look at the pancreas or other I, organs that might be involved. Yeah. Why? Might, why? Um, so why would we be wanting to look at, look at these other organs? Because you want to exclude something that would require um, surgery or other methods of management. Yeah. And uh, besides the pancreas, what other common pathology may... Uh, present as epigastric pain? Um, biliary pathology can also be around the epigastrium. Yes, exactly. Um, right. So it's um, gallstones or any gallbladder pathology that can present with upper epigastric or upper abdominal pain. And um, it's very important to exclude this because the patient may not in fact have ulcers even though uh, someone told them, oh, you've probably got ulcers, or they believe that they have ulcers. And in fact, they have gallstones. And the treatment for gallstones is obviously completely different uh, to that of peptic ulcers. And it's important to always exclude gallstones. Now, the corollary of this is also true, which means that the patient who presents with gallstones, so they come to you um, having been to a radiologist for an uh, abdominal ultrasound and the radiologist picked up the gallstones. They now are referred to you as the doctor to take care of these gallstones. You must make sure that they don't also have uh, peptic ulcer disease or some upper GI pathology, right? Because um, it will be, it will not be in the benefit of the patient that you go and refer them for a major laparoscopic cholecystectomy without having excluded upper GI pathology 
And after having removed the gallstones, the patient comes back to you two months later and says, but doc, I've still got the same pain. Okay, so it is possible, for example, for the gallstones to be asymptomatic and the patient actually has symptoms from a peptic ulcer or reflux or gastritis, which could have been easily treated medically without the need for a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, which may have turned out to be unnecessary. Okay, so please understand that upper GI pathology, uh, upper GI pain, epigastric pain, right, should have two investigations. One of them is the abdominal ultrasound, right, particularly to look at the uh, biliary tree, and two is an upper GI endoscopy to exclude uh, peptic ulcer or upper GI uh, pathology. Okay, this is a very important concept. Um, please bear this in mind. Right, moving on to uh, medical therapy. So what can we advise the patient on? Lifestyle modification is very important. Avoidance of non-steroidals, stop smoking, uh, decrease or stop alcohol ingestion and dietary modification. Right? These um, lifestyle modifications are not going to cure the ulcers, but they are going to reduce the symptoms. Right? We can also give the patient a course of PPIs, but on the next slide, I'm going to just um, go into a little bit detail about PPI therapy and what you need to be aware of. And then prior to evaluation for uh, H. pylori, if you're sending the patient for a scope, it's important to actually stop the PPIs for about two weeks, right, to prevent a false negative result. And um, an endoscopic biopsy will be required if the patient fails to clear infection. So if you're given two courses of PPI therapy and they still have symptoms, right, you should actually refer the patient for endoscopy and uh, request that the endoscopist does a biopsy of the pyloric antrum, or if there is in fact peptic ulceration, he will uh, proceed to biopsy these ulcers. Um, the PPI therapy should be continued for three months after the non-steroidals, et cetera, have been stopped, smoking has been ceased, et cetera. Now, it's important to bear in mind that PPI therapy itself has some uh, negative impact and that it can cause gastric hypochlorhydria and hypergastronemia uh, as well, leading to malabsorption of calcium, iron, and magnesium. Just bear in mind, hypergastric of gastric um, uh, from the gastric mucosa, and this lower down in the GIT leads to malabsorption of calcium, iron, and magnesium, and vitamin B12. Okay, now about PPI therapy. PPI therapy is highly effective, right? They are so effective at reducing gastric acid production that they can even mask a gastric carcinoma. So it's very important that before you put a patient on PPI therapy, you need to explain to them that at some point they are likely to need an upper GI endoscopy, especially if they are over the age of 40, um, if they have any history of uh, bleeding peptic ulcers, right? Uh, it's probably better, in, in fact, in those cases, to get the upper GI endoscopy done before you put them on PPI. The danger with putting people, people on PPI therapy is that it is so effective that they feel, wow, I've been cured, and um, they will then go to the pharmacy possibly or go to another doctor because they know that you had told them that they're going to require an upper GI endoscopy and they want to possibly avoid that. So they go to another doctor or they go to their local pharmacy and they buy the PPIs over the counter. And unfortunately, uh, besides the complications of PPI therapy, which I listed in the previous slide, it can also mask something as serious as a gastric carcinoma. And then what happens, the gastric carcinoma is obviously not going to uh, stop uh, progressing because of PPI therapy, it's going to progress. And then the patient is gonna present with an advanced gastric carcinoma. Uh, when it might be too late to do anything. Right, beware also of patients who doctor shop uh, because you told them, well, next time you come, I'm going to refer you to an upper GI endoscopy. They won't come back to you. They'll go to another doctor. And also PPIs are available over the counter at pharmacies without the need for a prescription. So patients will uh, use PPIs to their own detriment. Right, never give repeat PPI therapy until after the upper GI endoscopy has been done. 
Okay, um, guys, I trust that it's clear to all of you. If there's anything that you're not sure about, please put up your hands. Okay, now with regard to treatment of H. pylori, firstly, we should confirm this diagnosis. Um, in the uh, 2020 seminar on peptic ulcer disease, there's a lot of information on how to diagnose H. pylori and how to test for it. I'm not going to go into too much detail uh, today other than to say that there are uh, endoscopic tests which require endoscopy and biopsy, and there are other non-invasive tests such as uh, urea breath test, which uh, can be used to test for H. pylori. Right. Bear in mind that 10% of the population are H. pylori carriers, and not all of those patients actually have um, upper GI pathology associated with the H. pylori. Nonetheless, if you do uh, find upper GI pathology, you take a biopsy or you confirm H. pylori and you decide to treat it, there are different um, combinations of antibiotics. All of them require at least two weeks of PPI therapy, but there are some variations in the antibiotics. The first line that we use in public service in South Africa is a combination of amoxicillin and metronidazole. Uh, in the absence of metronidazole, patients can be given amoxicillin and clarithromycin, which is known as Clacid. And um, the third possibility is amoxicillin and doxycycline, together with bismuth, which is a coating agent uh, which tends to coat and protect the mucosa, the broken mucosa. Okay, so please bear these three options in mind. And uh, this is the, uh, it's usually a minimum of three different medications that are required to treat H. pylori. Okay, moving on to the surgical management of peptic ulcer disease. As I mentioned earlier, this is reserved for complications of peptic ulcer disease. Um, also, with the advent of advanced endoscopic therapy, a lot of treatment can now be done endoscopically through a scope that is passed orally without the need for a surgeon to uh, enter the peritoneal cavity. And please uh, bear in mind that resection surgery nowadays is reserved for complications of peptic ulcer disease. Right, 20 or 30 years ago in the 80s, um, gastric surgery was very common. If you've got friends, relatives, grandparents who had peptic ulceration or upper GI symptoms in the 80s, um, uh, you're likely to find that they would have had some type of resection surgery, right? And unfortunately, they are now suffering from the complications of that. Um, gastric surgery carries a very high risk of comorbidities and should be reserved, really, really reserved for complications of peptic ulcer disease. Okay, moving on to the first complication um, that I'd like to discuss, it is the refractory or intractable ulcer. This is an ulcer which has been diagnosed. It was documented at endoscopy. Biopsy was taken. Um, Helicobacter pylori may or may not have been confirmed. The patient was put on either Helicobacter pylori eradication if they were positive or the course of PPI therapy alone. And after eight to 12 weeks of treatment, the patient has ongoing symptoms, right? Um, if a patient is diagnosed with an ulcer, it is essential to repeat the endoscopy six to eight weeks after uh, the initial endoscopy to confirm healing. And if you repeat the endoscopy and you find that in fact the ulcer has not healed and still remains more than five millimeters in diameter, you would then call this a refractory or intractable ulcer. The differentials include malignancy, therefore multiple biopsies are required. It is possible that the patient is non-compliant, either they didn't complete their course of therapy or they are continuing with their bad habits of smoking, taking alcohol and uh, abusing non-steroidals. Right? There are other possibilities such as gastronoma. Uh, you may have heard of Solinger ellison syndrome. The patient may have motility disorder, which is contributing to the symptoms and they may have persistent H. pylori infection, and usually this requires a move to the second or third line of therapy uh, in case the H. pylori is not responding. There are also uh, causes of ulcers which are not due to peptic uh, etiology, and this includes tuberculosis of the gastric mucosa or duodenum, Crohn's, as well as primary intestinal lymphoma. And so all of these need to be considered 
if you are faced with a uh, refractory or intractable ulcer. And in the event that you exclude all of these and you consider that surgery is your only option, bear in mind that surgery should be individualized and reserved for patients with a giant ulcer of more than three centimeters in the stomach, more than two centimeters in the duodenum. Uh, complications of the ulcers, which we will go into after this slide, and of course, suspected malignancy. The surgical options available to the surgeon are wedge resection with a highly selective vagotomy, truncal vagotomy and drainage by, for example, pyloroplasty, and more extensive resection such as an entrectomy where the antrum of the stomach is excised with um, restoration of gastric continuity or reconstruction. Okay, now this is the next complication. Um, I've got two x-rays from different patients up here. Um, I'd like someone to volunteer as to the etiology. Sitabiso uh, Zubke. You with us, Sitabiso? Zubke. No. Siabonga Shongwe. Hi, Doc. Can you hear me? Hi, Siabonga. Can you see the X rays? Yes, I can. What uh, What do you think is going on? Um, looking at the elevation of the diaphragm. With the erect history, I think I would say there's a perforation that is going on there. Okay, but what do you see on the X-ray? Do you see a perforation on the X-ray? No, there is a under the diaphragm. Right. So that's uh, you are correct, Sir Bonga. But what I'm trying to teach you is that you must comment on the X-ray. Right. Don't give a diagnosis straight off. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the question was, what do you see on the X-ray? You said perforation. Now there's no way for you to see a perforation on the X-ray. It's not possible, right? Yeah. So you are correct in your ultimate diagnosis, but you need to go stepwise. So what we're seeing on the X-ray is subphrenic air. And can you just describe uh, where you can see that on both X-rays, Siobonga? Um, um, there's the one on the, on the left. Yes. Um, there is subphrenic air on both um, the left diaphragm and on yes. Um, yes, so on both diaphragms. So Correct. Both so diaphragms. yeah, that's right. So you can see this is a, a crescent shape. Remember, I told you about the crescent shape. It may be very small, but this is absolutely massive. This is the right hemidiaphragm, and this is the left hemidiaphragm. There's also a crescent shape there. Okay, so that's correct. And on this X ray here, it's not as clear, right? But basically, there is a lucency below the diaphragm. Right, and that would be in keeping with subphrenic air. Okay, good. So uh, subdiaphragmatic air is uh, relatively easy to appreciate, um, especially if you've got um, adequate uh, exposure of the X-ray showing the lung fields, because you see air above the lung field, uh, above the diaphragm and below the diaphragm, and that delineates the diaphragm for you. It may be as possible to see as little as one mil of free air, but the patient must be put in the upright position for that air to, by gravity, to find its way to the diaphragm, right? Um, normally, we request an erect chest X-ray, right, uh, showing the upper abdomen, but it is also possible to see this looking at the abdominal X-ray, which includes the bottom half of the chest, okay? Good. Um, another two x-rays. This is two x-rays of the same patient, an AP and a lateral. Let's see uh, what someone else can offer us. Zara Timol. Um, uh, the one on the left looks I'm gonna say similar to the previous two because you can see the crescent shape as you mentioned yes. and, and it and you can see the diaphragm clearly, and it's uh, bilateral. Correct. Um, on the lateral X-ray as well, 
you can you can see the same shape well a similar shape as well so you can see the diaphragm and then the crescent or it looks like a half moon but it's just on it right yes correct right so this is basically subphrenic a again just another example i'd say that this is very clearly a crescent shape this is possibly the gastric shadow it's difficult to say right but because of the subphrenic a uh, we're able to confirm that this is subphrenic air, but this is possibly an air fluid level with a gastric uh, bubble here, right? And there is some opacification on the left side, left lower um, lung fields, right? Could be due to compression or atelectasis, right? And then from a uh, lateral film or a lateral shoot through, we can see a very big multiple compound um, crescent shadow, right? And the important thing is that you have, like on this x ray, air above the diaphragm, air below the diaphragm, and you can clearly see the diaphragm. Similar principle here air above the diaphragm, air below the diaphragm, and you can clearly see a nice sharp outline of the diaphragm. Okay, good. Now, it's important to bear in mind that there are always differential diagnoses, right? And what is Chela DT syndrome? Anyone? It's a bit of a difficult one. Zemicele, zemicele, lutuli. Anyone wants to put up their hand, please feel free. Hi, Zemicele. Hi. Well, uh, I have no idea what uh, Chernitis syndrome is. Okay, no problem. Uh, thank you. Uh, someone had their hand up. Uh, Spindile. It's when the colon gets interposed between the, um, the liver and the diaphragm. Yes, good, correct. Right, so just like we have a bit of difficulty with the gastric shadow on the left hemidiaphragm, it is possible for the uh, hepatic flexure of the colon to get interposed between the right lobe of the liver and the right hemidiaphragm. Okay, and then you see, see these loops of colon here. You can see those up between the liver and the diaphragm. And this confuses the picture because um, you suspect the possibility of subphrenic air. Okay. Other differentials include subdiaphragmatic abscess. Remember, infective causes can cause um, gas formation, and that's how you get gas collecting under the diaphragm. But usually, this could be from a liver abscess or a subphrenic abscess from a perforated appendix that was not appropriately sorted out, right? And uh, then they present with gas under the diaphragm, which can be confused with subphrenic air from a perforated hollow viscous. Also, a mental fat interposed between the liver and diaphragm may complicate the picture. Uh, Subpulmonary pneumoperitoneum, right, where there's a, you know, remember that the diaphragm goes posteriorly and you can have air collected under the um, lung, right, but it is above the diaphragm, but because of its position, posteriorly it appears below this, right hemidiaphragm, for example, and that can confuse you. Right, an enlarged gastric bubble, for example, if this was just here without this crescent, we might have said, no, that's just the gastric bubble, right? And then um, a liver hematoma that also contains gas, for example, following trauma, okay? And um, this is what I mentioned earlier, that you can use both an erect chest X-ray, which includes a little bit of the upper part of the abdomen. You can also uh, use a lateral shoot through, <clears throat> but a CT scan is um, probably the most uh, helpful, right? The problem is that trying to get a CT scan in the acute phase in a patient who is acutely ill may not be possible. So the CT scan is more uh, reserved for those cases of diagnostic dilemma, uh, where you suspect one of these possible differentials and the history is not as clear cut as uh, we would want. Right, so, and the patient is of course stable. Okay, uh, guys, if there's any questions, please put up a hand. Okay, then in terms of um, 
operative intervention, it's important to risk stratify the patient. And there's a scoring system called the buoy score, which looks at three parameters, basically time since perforation, and that's divided into less than or more than 24 hours, preoperative systolic blood pressure, more than or less than 100, and severe medical comorbidities as per the American Society of Anesthetists, uh, level three to five. Right, and either those may be absent or present. And the score uh, taking each one of those factors, if all three are present, then the patient has a mortality as high as 38% and a morbidity of 77%. Right? So it's important to assess your patient before rushing them to theater because um, after looking at this type of risk stratification, one might decide, that the patient is elderly, they've got multiple comorbidities, they've presented late, they are already in shock. And um, if even if we do operate, the mortality is simply too high. And it may be better to discuss with the patient if they are conscious and able to speak to you or with the family to possibly treat such a patient conservatively. But it's important to bear in mind that um, the perforation can sometimes spontaneously close for example, the omentum can spontaneously adhere to the perforation and occlude it, and surgery may possibly be avoided in those circumstances, right? But that's not the norm, that is the exception rather than the rule. Okay, this is a picture that I'd showed you previously. Uh, this is an intraoperative picture of a perforated gastric ulcer, the pool. and the um, fibrinoparillant peritonitis is clearly visible. And lots of contamination because of chemical peritonitis from all the leaked uh, gastric acid. But, and just in summary of this case, the patient had presented with an acute abdomen with subphrenic air. The pain had started in the upper abdomen and epigastrium. There was a history of dyspepsia or peptic ulcer disease, and the patient had had a previous upper endoscopy. The important things uh, to appreciate on the x-ray together with uh, the clinical picture, you must be able to identify free subphrenic air, which we have done on the plain erect chest x-ray and differentiate it from the normal gastric bubble on the uh, left hemidiaphragm. Chiller DT syndrome, we've already answered that question. Definitive management of hollow visceral perforation, right, is surgical intervention, um, laparotomy, you locate the perforation, uh, either a Selen Jones or Gray Miller or mental patch, thorough washout, remove all contamination. You may need to only temporarily close the abdomen with a Bogota bag and consider the patient for relap in 48 to 72 hours time and the patient may need to be put into ICU postoperatively. Okay, the next slide actually shows a little bit of detail. This is not the same patient. You can see that the abdomen is far less contaminated here. But what is shown here is um, the creation of a Selen Jones patch. Right? So this is the ulcer that is shown. The suction is inserted. You can see the ulcer looks to be quite large, about three centimeter diameter. Right? What is done here, the omentum is used to plug the ulcer, right? And sutures are uh, taken from either side of the ulcer, right? And the knot is tied down over the omentum. There's the knot there. It's going to be tied down over the omentum. And the omentum, if this is the um, opening, the omentum is used to plug the perforation and the sutures keep the omentum in place and prevent uh, the omentum from slipping. Uh, this was the patient who did very well. They were picked up early. There was no need to do a temporary closure. The sheath was closed. Here you can see local anesthetic being injected. Um, the three by three centimeter perforation was um, repaired and the patient actually did very well and recovered in the general ward post-op instead of having to go to ICU. Okay, now um, it's important to appreciate the difference between Perforation of a gastric ulcer and perforation of a duodenal ulcer. These two are managed slightly differently. And we're going to ask someone uh, to comment on that. Uh, Sunira Sukdeo. 
Uh, hi, Doc. Hi, Sunita. Uh, okay, so the duodenal perforation, you is repaired, I know, with the um, cell and Jones or the or mantle patch. Mm -hmm. And this is especially if it's a large perforation. And the gastric perforation is managed with, um, I know it's with local resection and a patch repair if necessary. And if it's along the greater curvature, the antrum of the body, the ulcer is um, excised and closed. Yes, good. Um, any idea why there's a difference in this management? No, I'm not sure. I was actually going to ask that. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, anyone got any ideas of why there's a difference in the management between the two ulcers? Let's ask for one more volunteer. Sinatemba Sibia. Hi, Doc. I, I am not sure of why there's a difference in this management. Okay, thank you. Okay, so basically the reason for the difference is that there's a massive difference in the risk of malignancy. Now, duodenal ulcers are almost always, always, always benign, right? Whereas gastric ulcers have a significant risk of malignancy. And therefore, with the duodenal ulcer, it's not even necessary to biopsy that ulcer. So all is done is that a washout is done to clear all the contamination and a Selen Jones or Gray Muller patch is applied. And that's all that needs to be done. Okay, later, uh, the patient, uh, once they're out of hospital, they can be called back for a um, endoscopy, right, to confirm healing, etc. Gastric ulcers, on the other hand, is a significant risk of malignancy. Therefore, the ulcer must either be biopsied or resected, uh, either by partial gastric resection, ulcerectomy, or at the very least, a wedge biopsy of the ulcer is required. Right? And then thereafter, the ulcer can be closed if possible, if the anatomy and position of the ulcer allows it. And you can also use a patch in this instance. Right. Now, the other thing can perfect show you of that a bit later on. If they are, for example, in the anterior duodenum or anterior wall of the stomach, they can perforate into the peritoneum, and that's how you get a perforated ulcer. But ulcers can also penetrate, and this is how you get the typical bleeding ulcer because the ulcer can penetrate into the pancreas, it can penetrate into the gastroduodenal artery. Right. It can also penetrate into other organs such as the biliary tract. You can get a fistula between the uh, duodenum or stomach and the biliary tree. Uh, you can get penetration into the liver and into vascular structures. You can, in fact, have an aortoenteric fistula, which I'm sure you can appreciate is very dangerous. It can even perforate into the colon such that you get a duodenocolic fistula. Right. And the complications of this penetration include abscess formation, hemobilia, which is blood in the biliary tree, uh, massive hemorrhage, uh, elevated elevation in amylase, as well as um, a pancreatitis can occur. Okay, moving on to the next complication, which follows on penetration. What can you see on this slide? Right? This is a, a picture, endoscopic picture. Um, can someone comment for me on what they're actually seeing here? Louine Thiessen. Hi, Doctor. Hi, Louine. Um, I'm seeing a, like a sort of, I'm not sure it's a string, string substance like moving into the wall, like this, moving across the wall. You refer yeah. to this here. So what do you think that is? Yeah. What color is it? Uh, it looks red. Yeah, this isn't like yet, a reddish red. pink. Yeah, this, um, unfortunately, the mucosa looks a bit weird. But basically, this yeah. is in the uh, 
duodenum, right? Um, and this is a stream of blood. This is a oh. bleeding ulcer, right? So there's the ulcer here, right? And obviously this ulcer has penetrated into a major vessel and that vessel is squirting blood right across the oh. duodenum, so much so that the blood is hitting the opposite wall and collecting. So there's all the collected blood. And that's why I'm wanting to emphasize the emergency management of a bleeding peptic ulcer. Right, so I've already given you all a clue, resuscitation. Um, Louine, you're still with us? You want to go further with the management? Uh, of the bleeding ulcer. Okay, so we said that we would uh, resuscitate the, the patient okay. with the normal ABCs. Mm -hmm. um, we could also then move on to do an urgent endoscopy for this patient. So, okay, before we After get the... there, we have to stabilize the patient. You can imagine with this oh, like... type of blood flow um, leaking into the GIT, the patient's going to be in shock. And oh, okay, so mm -hmm. there's a clue because at the there was a... here. Oh, in so this is, this is a um, PPI. It's a generic name. I don't know. I don't know if this is even available, but if you can read here, it actually says omeprazole, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, so resuscitation, then uh, the IV um, PPI, and we can also give them a prokinetic agent, yes, like uh, methylchlopramide as well. Yeah. So the most important part, especially in the Q phase, is that IV PPI therapy, and I need you guys to know the exact dosage of this, right? Because if you are in casualty and you have a patient like this, you need to be able to set that up urgently and get it running, right? There's no time to be looking up on your phone, etc., and trying to work out the dose. So, Louis, do you know how to actually give the, it could be omeprazole, it could be, um, Ezimeprazole, it could be lanzoprazole, pentoprazole. We've got a whole range of PPIs available. Uh, no, doctor, sorry, I actually don't know the, the dosage. Okay, anyone, uh, thanks, Lillian. Anyone know the dosage? I need the very specific dosage. There's a, a bolus dose and an infusion dose. Okay, so I'm going to give you Cornelia Zibani. Um, unfortunately, I do not know the dose. Okay, thank you, Cornelia. Anyone else? No volunteers, no hands up. Okay, guys, it's absolutely essential that you'll know this dosing, right? I'm um, just going back to the resuscitation. IV line, wide bore, you may need more than one IV line if the patient is in shock. Remember to put up an NG tube. Uh, Louine didn't mention that. Um, right, nasogastric tube is going to decompress the stomach. It's going to tell you um, the character of the blood, whether it's coffee brown, co coffee grounds, or whether it's um, fresh blood. Right, IV PPI therapy, and this is where the dosage comes in. So we're going to start with the bolus, and the bolus is 80 milligrams IVI stacked, right? So fortunately, all the PPIs come in the same dosage. IV comes in a 40 milligram uh, vial. Usually it's a powder that has to be mixed up. Or if it is pre-mixed, it is usually in a volume of 10 moles, right? So 40 milligrams in 10 moles. So you've got to take two amps, either omeprazole, ezomeprazole, pantoprazole, lanzoprazole, any of those, right? Two amps, mix them up and give it as a IV bolus, right? And then once the IV bolus is in, we give an infusion, right? Is this sounding familiar to anyone? Is anyone now remembering? Yes, Spindila Tini? Spindila, you got your hand up? Yes, yeah, so don't you give like 80 milligrams IV and then you follow up with uh, eight milligrams per hour. Good, correct. So. Can you tell me how to mix up the solution so that you can give eight milligrams per hour? What, how many amps are you gonna draw up? 
how many um, mils is your bag of normal saline, how are you gonna actually do this mixing? It's very important because you are the guys next year who are gonna be on the front line who are gonna to have to mix up the solution. Now, there's no time to call the registrar and to check your phone you know, for the dosage. You need to know this dosage. No, Doc, I'm not sure how you give the eight milligrams per hour. Okay, Svendila. Anyone else know? Before I offer it, anyone else know how to mix this up? Right? It's not difficult. It's just a mixture that you need to know how to do. Right? So we wanted to run at eight milligrams per hour. Right? So the easiest thing to do is to try and get it to one milligram per mole. So remember I told you that each amp has 40 milligrams and usually 10 moles of solvent or solution. So you're going to take five times 40, which is 200 milligrams, and you're going to put it into a 200 mole bag. But remember that you are adding 50 moles of volume. So before you add the 50 moles of volume, you want to take out 50 moles of saline from the bag, right? So that you get exactly 200. And that into the infusion at eight moles per hour. Right, so eight moles per hour at 200 moles is not actually going to get you to 24 hours, right? But it's going to be a single infusion dose, which will run over 200 divided by eight, uh, which is you can calculate that quickly, it'll probably come to about 16 hours or so. Right? And if the patient is still actively bleeding, you may consider repeating that. Right? But this now is obviously going to give you time to catch up with your fluid. Right? And you can then in this hopefully first 24 hours, arrange an emergency upper GI endoscopy. Okay, so emergency management of bleeding ulcer, very important. Okay, okay any questions guys? All right, I'm now I'm going to move on to the endoscopy side of things where we're actually going to look at a little video which shows how uh, the um, bleeding can be treated. This video is about seven minutes long. Uh, the complete video is available at this link if you want to look at it yourself later on. But I've sort of cut out the relevant bits to show you here. Peptic ulcers are the most common cause of upper gastrointestinal GI bleeding. In most cases, the arterial diameters in bleeding ulcers measure less than 2 millimeters, but can be up to 3.45 millimeters. This is a clean based gastric ulcer. In general, flat pigmented spots are better visualized under digital chromoendoscopy such as narrow band imaging, NBI. Within this posterior bulb ulcer, a flat pigmented spot can be seen. A visible vessel is seen within the ulcer base. For actively bleeding ulcers, many experts advocate pre-injection in four quadrants to achieve temporary hemostasis and better visualization. Injection therapy delivers temporary local tamponade and vasoconstriction. Some bipolar probes incorporate an injection needle. During thermal coagulation, the bipolar or heater probe is placed firmly on the bleeding lesion to achieve local tamponade and coactive coagulation of the underlying vessel. A visible vessel is seen within the duodenal ulceration. 
thermal coagulation using a bipolar probe is used to achieve proactive coagulation. The probe is placed firmly on the vessel until, until cavitation or a footprint is obtained. For bipolar thermal coagulation, the energy output should be set at 20 to 25 watts, with the probe firmly applied on the vessel for several seconds. The tip of the probe is flushed with water after each thermal application. Increasingly, through the scope, TTS endoclips are being used to ligate bleeding vessels. Studies have shown that endoclip application is equally effective in achieving hemostasis when compared to thermal coagulation. Newly available endoclips accommodate up to a 16 millimeter opening span, can be reopened and repositioned repeatedly, and are easily rotatable. Unlike older versions, instinct clips are approved for MRI with field strengths of up to three Tesla. The advantages of using endoclips include no special setup, expedient application, non-thermal application, and the ability to approximate ulcer or defect margins, as well as to achieve hemostasis. Some versions of the endoclips have excellent rotational ability. A visible vessel can be seen in this antral ulcer. Endoclip application provides the ability to approximate the ulcer or defect margins as well as to achieve hemostasis. With these newer generation endoclips, on fast or tangential application is equally effective. To maximize the amount of target tissue captured inside the endoclip during clip closure, suction is recommended with opened clip arms gently pressed over the target tissue immediately before clip deployment. In approaching ulcer bleeding, over the scope clipping devices can also be used. This video case is provided by Dr. Thomas Pratt. The patient is receiving anticoagulation and there is an actively spurting antral ulceration. Hemostasis is immediately achieved with an over-the-scope clipping device application, i.e. a VESCO endoclip. During routine follow-up endoscopy, the over-the-scope clipping device is seen in a good position and around the ulcer crater. Gradual healing of this antral ulceration is documented on follow-up endoscopies. Hey, that was uh, quite a neat video. Um, if there's any questions, please put up your hand. We're going to run through each of those procedures that was shown there. Um, so endoscopy allows us a number of different options. The first thing that they showed was injecting dilute adrenaline, right? We inject it all around the ulcer base and that uh, causes vasoconstriction and reduces the blood flow and thereby makes the further management uh, more effective. 
uh, injection of adrenaline on its own, unfortunately, will not contain or control a bleeding ulcer, uh, but it is used as an adjunct before doing something more definitive endoscopically. Then there's a gold heater probe. Uh, this gold has just got to do with the name. Um, which and it also has a injection needle so you can inject uh, adrenaline as well as apply bipolar diathermy heat uh, to the uh, bleeding ulcer as you saw in the video and that will basically uh, cause the blood vessels to coagulate the through the scope clips was the next thing that was shown um, they mentioned a 16 millimeter diameter bite you were able to rotate the clip and they even showed an example of how uh, the tissue was a mucosa gastric mucosa was pulled closed over uh, the visible vessel right and uh, that was the third method they showed and then the fourth method was the over the scope clip which was a big clip that uh, bites directly over the ulcer and the last bit of the video clip showed that um, effectively controlling hemorrhage from a uh, gastric ulcer. Okay, so guys, if there's any questions, please put up your hands. I think that was a very nice video which explained just the endoscopic intervention. Uh, there's also radiological solutions. Can anyone tell me what the radiological options might be? Sabello Zulu. Hi, Sabella. Uh, I took so. I am not sure. Okay. Anyone want to put up their hand? Uh, Zikari non sikelelo. Zikari. Non sequela. Erin Taylor. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I think that the interventional radiologist can perform angiography and if you locate the bleeding vessel, then you can do super selective angioembolization. Yes, correct. Do you know what they use for angioembolization? Um, I, th I think there's a special glue that they can use. They can also use coils. Yes. Oh, there's these little metallic coils and then there's a sort of um, foam that they can inject, which is yeah, similar to a glue, which basically occludes the vessels and stops the blood flow. And uh, you're correct in that you need to super select the vessels because uh, unfortunately in the GIT, there's a lot of collateral um, circulation so you cannot just uh, sort of occlude or coil the gastrojudinal artery for example it's quite a massive vessel and you would actually need to get right down to the branch that is um, involved okay but that's correct uh, embolization using uh, uh, coils or some type of uh, gel foam that can be injected into the vessels can occlude the vessels okay so these are the non-surgical options um, endoscopic options, radiological options, and then of course if these fail, then one would have to proceed to a surgical option. And this usually um, in the duodenum, remember I spoke about a posterior duodenal ulcer penetrating into the pancreas, and typically um, this affects the gastroduodenal artery. And this vessel has a lot of collaterals, and for that reason, it actually needs to be tied off in at least three different points, right? Otherwise it will continue to ooze and bleed. I'm just going to expand that image a bit, right? And so the surgeon has to put a stitch uh, above, a stitch below, and usually a stitch to the right, which is towards the gastric side um, of the ulcer. Right? So the ulcer base can be managed by open surgery. Of course, one would have to mobilize the uh, duodenum and open up the duodenum, 
right? And then we always close, if we open up the duodenum longitudinally, we'll always close it uh, transversely so as to increase the diameter of the duodenum and reduce the risk of um, narrowing of the duodenum, okay? So this is the surgical intervention. This can also be done laparoscopically. Um, you may have to do a wedge resection of the ulcer if, you, if it's gastric and you're considering malignancy. Uh, also, if it's gastric and it's actively bleeding, you may have to consider distal gastrectomy as well as truncal vagotomy. Now, does anyone know the reason for doing a truncal vagotomy? Uh, who can we ask? Similani, Sipilani Ngezi, Similani. So the question is why uh, do we do trunkal vagotomies? What is the purpose of that? What is the trunkal vagotomy? Do you know? Uh, I'm not sure, but I can guess. Yeah. Uh, I think it's to minimize the, the blood flow towards the, the area of bleeding. Blood flow? No, not really. So, so what, what is a vagotomy? What are we actually cutting? Are we cutting a blood vessel or are we cutting something else? Is it an, a nerve? Yes, the vagus nerve, right? That's what vagotomy is derived from. So trunkal vagotomy means we find the trunk of the vagal nerve which is right up at the OG junction, and we transect that. Does anyone know why we do that? Sipilani has suggested blood flow, but it's not blood flow, it's something else. What else does the vagus nerve stimulate in the stomach? Tobila, hand is up, yes, Tobila. Um, it stimulates production of hydrochloric acid to yeah. digest the food. Correct, right. So uh, the vagus, one of the functions of the vagus is to stimulate the antrum, specifically the antrum of the stomach, to uh, produce acid. It also has other functions, and those functions are involved with gastric motility. Uh, that's why a truncal vagotomy is a bit of a problem because it causes uh, gastric amotility after it is performed. Right? And for that reason, we very frequently would combine a drainage procedure, such as a pyloroplasty, together with a truncal vagotomy. But uh, correct. So the reason for uh, transecting the vagus is to try and reduce acid production. Okay, But this is not frequently required nowadays because um, PPI therapy is so effective that uh, the incidence of truncal vagotomy has reduced tremendously. Okay, good. Okay, this is a uh, interesting endoscopic photograph. Uh, does anyone want to describe what they see here? I'll give you a clue. We're actually looking at the pylorus, just looking into the duodenum. The duodenum is back there. That's the opening into the duodenum, right? So we sort of right at the pylorus, maybe first part of the duodenum. No one wants to put up their hand. Who can we ask? Alia Fisahi. Uh, hi, Doc. Hi. Uh, it looks like there's um, there at the pylorus there's obstruction because it's quite narrow. Mm. Well, there is an opening. This okay. We, you can't see beyond that point because uh, of the angle of the scope, but it's not obstructed. But what what do you see? Is this normal? I'm not sure on the left-hand side, is that an, uh, an ulcer? Yes, there's an ulcer here, that whitish or yellowish um, discoloration. And also on the, on the right-hand side, it's blood vessels and an ulcer. Yeah, there's two, so there's two ulcers, right? And this one's got a bit of a visible blood vessel in the base. This one is a clean base. Uh, there's no obstruction, the pylorus is visible there. So do you know what this, it's called when you have two ulcers like this in the duodenum? No, I'm both sure. sides. 
Okay, good. Anyone else? Do you know what it is called when you have two ulcers on either side of the duodenum? So this is actually anterior duodenum. And if this were to continue penetrating, it will result in a perforation, right? And this is posterior duodenum. And that's why the blood vessel is there because as it penetrates posteriorly into the pancreas, it's very likely going to affect the gastrojudinal artery and result in bleeding, right? This is just the normal lumen of the duodenum. Now this condition is called anyone? Must have seen it somewhere, no? Right, they're called kissing duodenal ulcers, right? Because there's one, they're opposite each other. It's as if the two ulcers are kissing one another, right? And they are usually in the anterior and posterior walls of the first part of the duodenum. Okay. Okay, so that was um, bleeding ulcers and kissing duodenal ulcers. Now, the next complication, what can you see on the CT scan? I need someone to tell me what these two views are. They are two different views. Right, of the abdomen. This is a CT of the abdomen. Who can we ask? Sipesishle Zulu. Hi, Doc. Hi, Sipesishle. Um, I'm not sure. Um, okay, can you identify this, the views of the CT scan at least? What views are shown? Um, I think it's the posterior view, from, um, but I'm not sure. So what views do you get of a CT scan? What, what directions do you look at or look in? I'm not sure, doctor. Okay, anyone else? Timbani. Macheka Cheka, Timbani Macheka Cheka. Apologize if I'm mispronouncing your names. Uh, I'm not sure, Doug. Okay, can you give me, just give me the views at least. What are we looking at? So this is one picture. What direction is this looking at? What is it called? It is a CT scan, I've told you that. And this is another view. Right, so if you can at least give me the views, that's a start. Tabani? Uh, anterior, anterior, anterior. Mm -hmm. Guys, you're on final year medical school. You don't know about CT scans. Tobila? Um, the one on the left is a transverse view. And the one on the right is coronal, I think. Okay, so coronal is correct, good. Sorry, what, uh, what did you say the one on the left is? Transverse. Transverse, okay, another word is axial, good. Right, so basically the CT scan is made up of cuts. So you're cutting the patient's body into different slices, right? So this is an axial or a transverse slice. So you're looking at this. Um, Tabila, can you tell me what direction we're looking at? Because it's important that you guys actually understand what you're looking at when you're looking at a CT scan. Um, so you've taken a slice. Oh, okay. yeah. Yeah, I understand. You're looking from the top to bottom with the transverse. Oh. I think. So which is the left of the patients, and which is the right? Is is this this? Can you see my point? Is this the left? Yeah. So this is the left. That's that's the left. Okay, good. So. Basically, you're actually not looking from the top down, you're looking from the bottom up, right? So if, we, if you can see me on my uh, video, right? Um, okay, I'm showing it on my chest because um, my abdomen is not in the picture, but you're taking a slice through here, right? Right across, imagine a knife or a sword cutting me, right? Through and through, mm -hmm. right? And we're not looking from above, we're looking from below. So we're looking at the... We are standing at the foot end of the bed and we're looking up, right? That's why this is the left, this is the right, this is obviously posterior, we can see the vertebra, and that's anterior. Okay, 
So it's very important that you'll actually understand what you're looking at when you look at a axial slice. Right? And then coronal is very simple. It's the patient standing in front of you and the slice has come down like um, a straight line. Right? And we're looking as if the front of the patient has fallen away and we're looking at the, the slice that's gone through. Guys, you'll understand what I'm talking about? I'm going to show you an image just now. This is very important that you'll actually understand this. Uh, Tobilet, can you see the pathology at all? Can you tell me anything about the pathology? Just bear in um, mind. I think it's the, in this. Yeah. We're talking about complications of peptic ulcers. So I have given you a list of the things we've been going through, each of those things one by one. So what's left? Um, the gastric outlet obstruction. So yeah, I think that's the good. stomach and it's dilated. Yeah. You can see an air fluid level on the transverse. Correct. Direction. Correct. Right. So this is a massive stomach. This, is the, this entire thing is the stomach. Right. And Tobila is correct. There's an air fluid level. Right. And basically this is the stomach extending. It's pushing the left diaphragm up. It's so full. Right, because the patient has continued to eat and drink and none of the food is going through. Right, this is coming up. We can't actually see the duodenum, but the duodenum is somewhere back there. It's completely obstructed. And this is just a hugely dilated stomach. You can see how big this is, stretching right across the abdomen. It's going all the way down, almost into the pelvis. There's the pelvic brim there. Right, it's almost into the pelvis and it's even pushing up the left hemidiaphragm. What clinical feature would you find here, Tobila? Um, a succussion splash. Yes, if the patient is lying on the bed and you put a hand on either side of the abdomen and you shake the patient a bit, you can actually hear the splash even without using a stethoscope. Right? That's how loud it's going to be because this air and fluid in there is going to splash about and that's called a succussion splash. Right Now, there's a specific metabolic abnormality that's associated with gastric artery obstruction. Uh, it's associated with persistent vomiting. Let's ask someone else. Tobila has done very well. Uh, who have we got left? Loeen Thiessen. Have we? I think we've asked Loeen. Caitlin. Caitlin Theophilus. Hi, Doc. Can you hear me? Yes, Caitlin. Um, is it your metabolic um, alkalosis? Yes. Correct, but it's more than that. There's a couple of other um, electrolytes that are grossly abnormal. So I accept yeah. metabolic alkalosis. Anything else? Hypo, what else? Hypo, goes below? hypo uh, kalemia and your Correct. hypocalcemia. Yes, right. So there's a very specific anomaly that occurs due to vomiting of acid rich gastric um, material. Right, so there's hypochloremia, chloride goes low hypokalemia, potassium goes low, with metabolic alkalosis, with a paradoxical aciduria, right, and hypocalcemia. Okay, so it's very important that you guys remember this abnormality. So if you see a patient with a succussion splash, um, you are worried about gastric outlet obstruction, right, you must be looking out for all these abnormalities. Right, we're gonna go into this in a little bit more detail just now. I want to first look at uh, the CT imaging that I spoke about just now. Right, so these are the planes that I was talking about, the axial or transverse plane. So this is cutting the patient um, from anterior to posterior and we are looking from inferiorly. We're looking as if the patient is lying on the uh, CT scan bed and we are standing at the foot end of the bed and we are looking up at the patient's which is the case one is a transverse cut like this. So coming down, um, my video has gone off. Coming down like this is a coronal view and sagittal is coming like this, okay? And this is an example of a sagittal view where we can see the vertebral column posteriorly, right? And the anterior abdominal wall anteriorly. Right? Then there's also other types of reconstruction with CT. Right, and CT angiogram can have 3D. This is now unrelated, but that's just an example of something that you may see. Anyone want to volunteer? 
Dumiso Seconde, can you tell me what you think is visible on this CT angiogram reconstruction? It's a 3D recon. Right, you've got some clues here. There's a renal artery, right renal artery, left renal artery. Sianda Shezi. And so yes. Yes, I, I think it's an uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Yes, correct, right? It's a triple A, right? There's a dilation in the abdominal aorta. It's infrarenal, right? And um, it's just an example of a 3D reconstruction of a CT angiogram. Very good. Okay, getting back to the management of gastric artery obstruction, acute management nasogastric tube, IV fluid. What is the best fluid to use? Nandamisa, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. What fluid would you use getting back to gastric artery obstruction? So we spoke about a hypochloremic, hyponatremic, hypokalemic um, metabolic alkalosis with hypocalcemia. So what would be the best fluid to actually resus this patient with? Oh, I'm not sure. I think <clears throat> uh, normal saline. Oh. Yes, good. And what would you add to the normal saline? <sighs> what is the most dangerous electrolyte if it's low? High, if whether it's low or it's high, it's a very dangerous electrolyte. It's hypercortisium, it's hypercalcemia. Yes, right. So remember, this patient is going to have low potassium. So the best fluid to use is normal saline and add some potassium to that. Okay, and remember that fluid therapy in this patients must be very slow. You don't rush fluids in because you can actually worsen the situation. So it's flow, slow fluid resuscitation. Um, obviously, you're going to give them a bolus if they're hypovolemic, but in terms of correction, you're going to very slowly correct all those abnormalities. And the best fluid to use is normal saline with potassium. But right, you're going to give PPI therapy because very frequently uh, the reason for the gastric outlet obstruction is a benign ulcer. But right, if it's malignant, it's a whole other problem. And there's not much you can do, but you can at least correct all of these. If the patient is malnourished, you may consider giving TPN. And as soon as you can, uh, you need to lavage the stomach because there's all those gastric contents that's gonna obscure your endoscope. But as soon as you can, maybe within the first seven to 10 days after admission, once you've corrected all the electrolyte abnormalities, you would want to do an upper GI endoscopy, rule out malignancy. And it also allows you to do certain therapeutic options such as pneumatic dilatation, right? With a, a balloon, right? But there's a very high risk of perforation. Surgical interventions, we're going to look at briefly. There's resection procedures, pyloroplasty procedures, as well as bypass operations. This is just an example of the endoscopic treatment. So we've got benign obstruction here, right? It may be possible to get a guide wire through the narrowing. And if you can, you can then put a pneumatic balloon through. I've mentioned that the pneumatic balloon is at risk for perforation, right? And if there's cancer, it's uh, bigger risk, right? but it may be your only option. Right? You then dilate the area and you may be able to put a uh, expanding metal stent. Okay. This treatment of the uh, TPI therapy uh, reduces the inflammation if there's obviously no cancer and this can settle spontaneously uh, in a couple of weeks time without the need for surgical intervention. However, if there is a need for surgical intervention, I mentioned resection procedures. Resection procedures involve an operation such as a, a resection of the pylorus and the antrum of the stomach, which is called an antrectomy. And the reconstruction may be a bullroth one, which is a gastroduodenal uh, reconstruction, or a bullroth two, where the stump of the duodenum is left in situ 
and a loop of the jejunum is brought and anastomosed to the stomach. Now guys, you don't need to know these in detail, but you just need to have an idea of the different types of gastric operations. Right, pyloroplasty, where there's narrowing of the pylorus, um, you can actually cut directly over the pylorus. There's different types. There's the Heinecke Mikulix pyloroplasty, there's a Finney pyloroplasty, Moschel and a Jabule pyloroplasty. Basically, you're cutting longitudinally and you're going to close it uh, transversely so that you increase the diameter of the duodenum. Okay, if there's any questions, guys, please put up your hands. <coughs> uh, then it may not be possible to do the pyloroplasty, it may not be possible to do the resection. Patient is in a poor condition, you want to do as little as possible. And you may consider doing what is called a gastric bypass procedure or a gastrojejunostomy, where you're going to anastomose the uh, side of the stomach to the side of the jejunum. Right? And this allows the food to pass directly into the small bar and allows this area to heal. Okay, so those are the three uh, categories of operations that can be done for gastric outlet obstruction. And that brings us to our last complication, uh, which is a giant duodenal ulcer. Now, giant duodenal ulcer overlaps quite significantly uh, with refractory or um, intractable ulcer. And what we see here is a huge ulcer in the duodenum, right? And in terms of definition, if it's more than two centimeters in the duodenum, it is a uh, giant ulcer. If it's more than three centimeters, it is a, in the stomach, it is a giant ulcer. And um, how this normally occurs is that the patient has an endoscopy, giant ulcer is diagnosed, biopsies are taken, biopsies come back as um, non-benign, as benign, sorry, there's no malignancy and possibly there is some helicobacter pylori. The helicobacter pylori is treated, the repeat endoscopy is done, and it's found that the ulcer is not healing adequately. It's still uh, large, it may not be as massive as two to three centimeters, but it hasn't healed fully in the expected period of six to eight weeks. So for example, another course of eradication therapy is done, is given to the patient, a repeat endoscopy is done, a further six to eight weeks down the line, and you find that it still has not healed. Right? So in this instance, you've got to be very wary of complications, of possible problems such as underlying malignancy, which has not been diagnosed. And um, you need to consider further intervention. Repeat biopsy, still no malignancy on the biopsy, but um, another possibility are things like Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, which is a gastronoma which stimulates um, acid production and patients develop these massive ulcers. So one may need to do a serum gastrin level right, to exclude that possibility. And if all of those are excluded, uh, we spoke about other causes of non-peptic ulceration such as TB, Crohn's, etc. All of those have been excluded, then your only option may be a surgical intervention, uh, which may involve surgical resection of the ulcer and repair. So it may be if it's a duodenal ulcer, you may resect that portion of the duodenum and uh, do a um, antrectomy with a bullroth one repair, or you may uh, do a resection of the antrum and the uh, distal stomach and do a bullroth two repair. Okay, <clears throat> that actually brings us to the end of today's lecture. So just in review, we looked at the epidemiology and pathophysiology. We spoke about helicobacter pylori and non-steroidals, right? how important they are in the pathophysiology or pathogenesis of peptic ulcer disease. We mentioned the management. We spoke about the acute management. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on the, um, how to mix up the PPI solutions, right? uh, both a bolus and a uh, infusion. We then spoke about medical therapy, we spoke about endoscopic therapy, and then we spoke about surgical therapy, which we noted is reserved for um, complications of peptic ulcer disease. Refractory, intractable, giant ulcer, I'll put those all together. 
We spoke about perforation and penetration. Penetration, one of the complications is bleeding. And lastly, we spoke about gastric outlet obstruction. So that actually brings us to the end of this lecture. Uh, guys, if there's any questions, please put up your hands, unmute your mic. Any questions on peptic ulcers? Does everyone understand anything that you need me to go over again to repeat? Yes, we've got a hand up, Siobhan. Uh, hi, Doc. I just wanted to know, for the eradication therapy, is there any PPI that you would uh, uh, like advise to use, or is it just what's available in terms of like omeprazole or lensoprazole? Yeah, the PPIs are pretty much all the same. They're all very effective. Um, usually in public service, I think we have lensoprazole available. I don't know if they've changed it recently, mm -hmm. uh, but that is perfectly effective, yeah. And remember that is given orally for eradication. Eradication therapy is given orally. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay, if there's no questions, I'm going to end the lecture here. Just give everyone another minute or so. Might be thinking up a question or something, anything you're not clear about, um, there's We've got like uh, 15 minutes. We can uh, look at the slide again. If anyone wants anything explained, please just put up your hand and we can look at it again. Anything that you're not too sure of? Nothing? Okay, so guys, tomorrow is the last lecture. It's on um, abdominal trauma approach to abdominal trauma. Uh, there is already stuff uploaded on Moodle. So please try and take a look at that in advance of the lecture. And um, we will start at 2.30 tomorrow. Aliyah's hand is up. Uh, hi, Doc. Hi, Leah. Uh, to follow Siobhan's question um, with the PPI, how long is it used for? So, like, I know for, what, so for what indication? For eradication or? Yeah, for eradication. The eradication is actually only given for two weeks together with the antibiotics. Okay. So yeah, one to two weeks, I would prescribe it for two weeks and we generally give it in a slightly higher dose. Most of the tablets come in the 20 milligram, uh, which is a half dose. Uh, remember that the full dose PPI is a 40 milligram uh, like the IV version. So the 20 milligram would be given BD uh, or it's, uh, you can tell the patient to take two capsules at the same time, as long as they get 40 milligrams a day for two weeks. And then you can review them in two weeks and um, you should at this point be considering whether there's a need for an upper GI endoscopy. That's if they're an older patient and if they have certain risk factors. If it's a younger patient, you may um, decide that there's no need for further therapy as long as the patient is feeling well you can tell them uh, that there's no need for further therapy and to follow up with you or call them back within a month's time just to see how they're doing. Um, and if they have no further symptoms, there's no need to do anything else. If they have a recurrence of symptoms, then I would probably want to do a repeat endoscopy. It's possible that they've got uh, something going on that uh, hasn't healed fully. And um, I would um, prefer to do the endoscopy before giving them the repeat dose of eradication therapy. If you're giving eradication therapy on its own, for example, if it's just reflux, um, you know, I wouldn't want to give it for more than three months at a time. But you should move out of the um, giving PPIs for long term. Right? There are certain indications and those should be, um, you know, assessed by the appropriate gastroenterologist and uh, given long term. But otherwise, uh, PPI therapy is really just for short term therapy two weeks at a time for eradication and possibly a maximum of three months if you are having a troublesome patient, for example, with an intractable ulcer. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Okay, so if there's no other questions, uh, we're gonna sign off now and then I'll see you guys tomorrow also at about 2.30. Uh, we'll uh, start the broadcast 15 minutes earlier so that everyone can sign in.
there is a uh, questionnaire at the end of the um, this. Uh, Yes. Should I have evening further? <laughs>